Welcome to tonight's statewide advocates call. My name is Adrian Kelly and my partner Cheryl Carter and I are the co-executive directors of Democracy North Carolina. Cheryl, can you give the folks an emoji wave? Great. As we're waiting for folks to trickle in, please feel free to drop your name in the chat, your pronouns, what county you're joining us from, and what is something you're hoping to learn tonight? If you've been with us for a while, we would love to know something you're excited about as well. Let's see who's joining us. I see Carol and Linda. Thanks for being here. All right, Takesha's here from Onslow County and Jeff from Mecklenburg. Hi, Sherry. Sherry's from Guilford County and someone from Forsyth. Glad to have you. We've got Virginia from Orange County as well and Mary from Mecklenburg. All right, folks are coming in from all over the state and we're so delighted to have all of you. We are very excited to welcome an experienced group of panelists who have held elected office and will discuss offices that are on the ballot aside from the presidency and why you should care. We will go over what you can do to help voters this election. And we'll want, to, want you to stick around for this because we're excited to announce a couple of new opportunities that we have. Of course, we'll also take time to answer any questions you have and learn how we can support you in the future. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're excited you have found us. Democracy NC is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to utilizing organizing, research, and advocacy to protect and expand the right to vote in our state. Are you wondering how we do this? Our regional managing organizers, or RMOs as we call them, work across the state to promote civic engagement in their communities. They coordinate various election protection programs, such as our nonpartisan voter hotline which provides voters with the resources they need at the polls and at home. If you're here tonight, we're guessing you want to learn more about voting or how you can engage in elections. Some of you have volunteered with political parties in the past and want to learn more about nonpartisan opportunities, or maybe you served as a poll worker and want to see what more you can be done to serve voters in this election. Regardless of your reason, you're in the right place. While we wanna make sure that you are prepared for this upcoming election, we also want to highlight the importance of bringing your community together to serve a common purpose. And while elections are one way to do that, we recognize there are other ways of engaging and participating in our electoral system. We also provide resources to enable you, to enable voters to digest all the things we'll be talking about tonight. Resources such as what's on the ballot, and voter ID flyers, primary FAQ wallet cards, resources for justice-involved communities, and so much more, all of which is available at demnc.co slash resources. Don't worry about writing that down or any other URLCC. As part of signing on for this training, we'll email you all of the slides. And as always, you can find even more election resources at our voting hub ncvoter.org. The one thing we ask is that you don't keep this information to yourself. Whatever is your main takeaway, please share these resources with your local places of worship, community and neighborhood groups, and social networks. However you choose to engage, this is just one thing you can do to help voters this election. Now we'll officially kick things off with what's new. Let's hear some updates from our policy team. Take it away, Carol. Thanks so much, Adrian, and welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see some familiar names and a lot of new names. Um, and we are going to get into what not only you should know ahead of the 2024 primary election, um, but as Adrian mentioned, what we want you to remind your family, your friends, and other voters in this election. So first and foremost, we want you to know when to vote, when election day is, and many folks don't realize that a primary election is happening. We actually hear from a lot of folks that 
um, they're prepared for the November general election, but they don't realize that a primary um, is in the works. So um, the first thing is just know the important dates. So election day for the primary is going to be on Tuesday, March 5th. Um, we already have seen early voting starting, but that last day of early voting will be Saturday, March 2nd. Um, and there are also other important dates for voters that might experience issues at the polls and need to make a correction to their ballot. And so if they are looking to make those corrections, voters will have until Thursday, March 14th to return, um, depending on their circumstance. And while there have been many changes to election laws and administration through the passage last year of Senate Bill 747, we are only going to focus tonight on changes that are most likely to impact voters. And one of the biggest changes in the last year that you've maybe already heard of, either through the news or if you've already been with us through a regional coalition call, is the new photo ID requirement. Um, so you will need an acceptable photo ID to vote in this upcoming election. And there are several forms of photo IDs that are acceptable. And we do have some resources, specifically our voter photo ID resource that will provide you an overview of what those IDs are. Now, most voters we know have some form of an acceptable ID, such as a driver's license or passport. But if you or someone you know forgets their ID at the polling place, they do have the options, and our voter hotline is also available to answer any questions or point you to the right resources. So a few reminders about the photo ID law. Um, so I touched on which IDs, but another common question we often get from folks is um, what student IDs are acceptable? So we have created a resource to help folks out that um, maybe you are a younger person on this call, or maybe you're trying to help register um, student voters on college campuses, or you have a son and daughter in school. And in those cases, we have a handy map that we have worked in partnership with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, where you will get to see where the accepted student IDs are. Um, and we also know that this information is available on the State Board of Elections website, and we'll be dropping those links in the chat and sharing them with you later. Um, but that's just one resource we want to, to touch on. Another thing we want you to know about photo ID um, are those options, as I was mentioning earlier. If you're not able to, um, to bring your ID if you show up to the polling place and you're without it. So you always have the option of returning and going home and grabbing it if you know where it's at and you still have time to vote, um, which is what we highly recommend. But if you don't, you also have the option to vote via a provisional ballot, which is a ballot that you cast if um, there's a question about your eligibility requirements. And then you would need to return to the County Board of Elections to provide your photo ID before the pre-Canvas deadline or before the Canvas deadline, which would be on Thursday, March 14th. Um, so that's another option that you have and other voters have if they forget their ID. Um, but a third option is to complete an ID exception form. So with an ID exception form, if you do not have um, a photo ID, and we, we saw in this last election that sometimes people lose their IDs, sometimes they're waiting for them in the mail, there's a lot of different circumstances, um, there is an exception form if you have a reasonable impediment, and there are a lot of acceptable reasons for that, such as lack of transportation, um, disability or illness, um, maybe a work schedule didn't allow you to get that ID, that appointment with the DMV when you needed it. And so if you if any have any of those situations, you can fill out a reasonable impediment form. There's also an other option on the form itself. So there is a place, as you'll see in this picture on the slide, for for voters to put any other options that don't fit in one of those categories. Um, but it is really important that if you're choosing this option that you sign your name at the bottom because the form itself has to be completed correctly um, and that you are um, ensuring that if you provide your contact information to the county boards, um, you're on the lookout in case there's, there's any issues they need to alert you to. Um, and the county boards of elections must approve the form if they believe the statement to be true, and they can only reject it with a unanimous vote. And if the form is rejected, the voter must be notified and given the opportunity to be heard prior to the county campus. 
Um, and the last reminder we want to give you around photo ID is that um, another option is to get a free voter ID from your county boards of elections. Um, so there is a period of time where you can do this. For instance, you can't you can't get a free ID from them for the period following the last day of early voting through election day. Um, but any other time you're set to go even after election day to get that free ID and, and use that as an alternative option. And they're good to go for about 10 years. Um, you don't need any special documents. You do need to provide, if you're already a registered voter, your name, your date of birth, and the last four digits, um, or the last four digits of your social security number. So that's our updates on photo ID, just reminders for folks, especially if um, you're helping other people out there and they might ask you those questions. And now we'll turn it over to Keith to talk about voting by mail. All right. Thank you, Carol. Uh, for this, we'll go through some reminders and then some updates. Uh, just one week left uh, for submitting an absentee ballot request form. The deadline for that is uh, next Tuesday, February 27th at 5 p.m. And then the deadline for submitting a voted absentee ballot in person is at 7.30 p.m. on Election Day, so Tuesday, March 5th. Uh, important thing to note here, if you plan on handing in your absentee ballot on Election Day, you want to take it to your county board of elections office and make sure that you tell other people to do that too. If they wait until the last day, take it to the county board of elections office. And then lastly, when voting by mail, voters must include a photocopy of an acceptable ID inside the photo ID envelope and that comes with the ballot or complete the ID exception form. And so what happens if you have issues with your ballot? Well, as Carol mentioned, uh, providing some contact information on a voter registration form or absentee ballot request form, the county, your county board of elections will contact you if there are issues. And so some of the things that voters can cure are issues with the voter did not sign or they signed in the wrong place or the voter did not attach an ID or a photo ID exception form. Uh, some things that voters can't hear by voter certification is if the envelope arrives unsealed, if there is a missing notary signature or seal, and then also if a witness or assistant did not print their name, address, or sign the ballot envelope. And then lastly, for my part, I just want to let you all know about the signature verification pilot program. I do want to preface this that no mail in absentee ballot can be rejected by the County Board of Elections for failed signature verification alone, and that this is only a pilot program, but it's something important for you to know. So, starting in the 2024 primary, uh, Bertie County, Cherokee County, Durham, Halifax, Henderson, Jones, Montgomery, Pamlico, Rowan, and Wilkes would be part of the signature verification pilot program. If you know people in those counties, definitely let us know. I do want to try to get people out to attend those County Board of Elections meetings. Uh, but the implementation uh, date for this will be after the 2024 primary county canvas. And then in May, the North Carolina State Board of Elections will be responsible for submitting an, an evaluation or report of the uh, verification pilot program to the General Assembly. And I'll toss it over to you, JP, for more updates. Great. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, Carol. And thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about changes uh, to voter registration and what DEMNC is doing about it. Um, so first up, voter registration application, the, the one y'all are probably all familiar with. Um, if you're a first-time voter or assisting other voters in registering, you will notice that new voter registration forms now require voters to provide a driver's license number or the last four digits of your social security number or to check a box if that voter has neither. If you are checking that box because you don't have the driver's license or social, uh, then the voter must provide a HAVA, uh, Help America Vote Act document. Um, an example might be a utility bill or bank statement uh, when they present to vote for the first time to confirm their name and address. Now, the big change, uh, same-day registration. 
For voters registering during the early voting period, we will be providing a list of acceptable documents that provide proof of residency. Uh, for student voters, documents providing proof of residency could be any university document that contains the student's name and residential address, such as a transcript or an invoice from the university. Um, another note on same day registration, your proof of residency uh, documents can be electronic, meaning you could pull it, pull it up on your phone. Um, so if you haven't printed it off and brought it yet, you're not, it's not the end of the world there. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the court case that Democracy NC is involved in. This is Democracy NC versus Hirsch. Last summer, lawmakers passed changes to our SDR, uh, same day registration, through Senate Bill 747. We sent students through our Democracy Summer Program to tell lawmakers why we thought our current SDR system worked and how it would disproportionately burn in, burden the students uh, the most, including those students that, that we work with. The change to the uh, same day registration provision of the bill will require CBOE staff to retrieve ballots that had their voter registration cards bounced back in the mail. These cards are then used to verify a voter's mailing address. However, we know that mail er errors happen all the time for no fault of the voter. Bounce backs in the mail are most likely due to disproportion are most likely to disproportionately impact youth voters especially if they are students because of the way colleges and universities often list residential addresses uh, very differently. Um, there is, like Keith was mentioning in terms of absentee, there is a cure process now for same day registration. So an SDR voter ballot will count if the first verification card that is mailed to them is not returned uh, as undeliverable by 5 p.m. two days before county canvas, that would be March 13th, uh, an SDR voter will need to take additional steps for their ballot to count if that first verification card is returned as undeliverable before 5 p.m. two days before county canvas, again, March 13th. Uh, there are two options for an SDR voter to verify their address uh, during CURE. One of those is, again, submitting a copy of a HAVA, Help America Vote Act document to the CBOE no later than 5 p.m. on the day before county canvas. Uh, the HAVA document may be provided to the CBOE by email, fax, or in person uh, at the CBOE office. Alternatively, that voter may attend the CBOE's canvas meeting to verify their address in person if they cannot provide a HAVA document by the day before county canvas. The same day registration voters have a document must match the resident's address on the early voting application. In other words, the registration form for the voters ballot and registration to be approved. Now, as we said, these are just a few of the highlights that may impact you or a voter you know. Please feel free to drop questions in the chat and we will come back. Well, not in the chat. Please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A section. I don't know if I'm actually pointing at it. Uh, and we'll come back to them and answer those throughout the presentation and at the end of our presentation. Uh, we will also be getting you resources with an expanded list of these changes. So anything you weren't able to follow from me, we'll have it in writing. And if you ever need help, you can call our voter protection hotline at 888-OUR-VOTE. Now we'll turn it over to Marquez to get us started with what's on the ballot. All right. Thank you, JP. So as you said, now it's time to talk about what's in the ballot. We heard about the election changes, but we want to know what's on the ballot and why you should even care. Well, as many of you know, in the primary election, voters select which candidate will appear on the ballot box for a given political party in the general election in November. For example, the winner of a Democratic Party primary will be that party's nominee on the general election ballot in November. It's important to note that North Carolina is a semi-closed uh, primary state. In a partisan primary, voters affiliated with the political party may only vote in their party's ballot and may not vote in another uh, party's primary. Unaffiliated voters may choose the Democrat, Libertarian, Republican, or nonpartisan ballot if available in a primary election. Some political races will also have a no preference option appear at the bottom of their ballot. Did you know that more than 30% of voters fail to complete their entire ballot? 
In a new Meredith poll conducted in February of this year, 69% of North Carolinians surveyed said that there was a serious threat to our democracy. On a related question, 91% of North Carolina voters believe that it is important that the country remain a democracy. That means committed to democratic principles. Through these results, we see that there is a strong desire from voters like you to protect democracy. And that's why we're so happy that you are here tonight. In an election year where many voters may feel disillusioned about their voting options or may be voting for the first time, it's really important to remember yourself and to remind others not to skip the small races, uh, such as the local county commissioner races. Another race that is not small but often can be uh, overlooked is the state Supreme Court race, which is a super important uh, uh, position that will be on the ballot this year. Local and state races matter in building a multiracial and representative democracy and are more likely to impact the lives of everyday voters like you and the people you love. So now we're going to pass it to Adrian Kelly to help us humanize this discussion. Adrian, I think you might be on mute. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Marquez. Uh, thanks to Keith, JP, Carol for all that. That was a lot of information. And what we want to do now is to get some perspective from folks who have held various statewide and local positions. With us tonight, we have Judge Carolyn Thompson. In 2023, Governor Roy Cooper appointed Judge Carolyn Thompson to the North Carolina Court of Appeals. This court is the second highest court in, the North, in North Carolina and sets a precedent for the lower courts throughout North Carolina. Judge Thompson is the only African-American female out of 15 judges serving on the Court of Appeals and has also served as the first woman on Superior Court and as a district court judge for North Carolina's Ninth Judicial District, serving Franklin, Granville, Vance, and Warren counties. We also have Linda Coleman, who served as chairman, chairwoman of the Wake County Board of Commissioners and was elected three times to the North Carolina House of Representatives. She has experience working in human resources management and was appointed Director of State Personnel by Governor Purdue. Coleman served as director from 2009 to 2012. And finally, we have Dr. Jim Martin, who's been a resident of Wake County since 1994. He was elected to and served on the Board of Education for four terms from 2011 to 2022. In that capacity, he chaired, chaired the board for one year and the policy committee for seven years. Dr. Martin is a professor of chemistry at North Carolina State University, where he teaches both undergraduate and graduate students and runs an internationally recognized research program in inorganic physical chemistry. Welcome all of you. I'd like to start with uh, you, Judge Thompson. Could you talk a bit about the role of the Court of Appeals in the legal system and share a little bit about your journey to pursue this office? Thank you, Mr. Thompson's um, reference to the Supreme Court being a very important race for everyone to remember, but therein lies where I'm going with my presentation is that the Court of Appeals is also very important because it is um, the second highest appellate court that we have in the state. And quite often you can't get to the Supreme Court until you come through the Court of Appeals. It is a court of review and we sit in panels of three. We are assigned approximately 15 cases every two weeks that cover all of our lower courts decisions. So we review whether or not the lower courts, the lower um, trial courts, the district court, superior court, judges may have misapplied or incorrectly applied the law or even got it right. And I kind of tell people when I'm out explaining what I do, the most important thing you can say in your trial, if you feel like you didn't get a fair shot, if you didn't feel like the court applied the law correctly or just didn't get it right, the two important words are, are I appeal. And when you appeal, it comes up to the Court of Appeals and we look at the record, we look at what was happening at that time. And I think the advantage that I have in this position is that I've only, that I have also appeared 
in front of the trial courts. I've sat on the trial court benches, so I know what's going on in the courtroom. I understand what it what it's like to be a district court judge, hearing family law matters, juvenile matters. And so when it comes up to my court where I'm sitting now, I have a different perspective, say, if someone has never tried a case or really is not familiar with the judicial system. I think it's very important for people to understand the uh, experience level when you're at this level of court making decisions that impact the entire state. So I was just looking at my um, stacks today or my books behind my uh, desk in my chambers and things that I have already authored. I've already authored 23 opinions and I've only been on on this seat since September when the governor appointed me. And it impacts the entire state. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve in this capacity. That's fantastic. You clearly have a lot of experience and have gone up the ranks in the the judicial area. What do you think, what qualities should voters look for in candidates for judicial races? Again, I think it's about the experience. You can't come into this level deciding um, whether people keep their children, if their rights have been terminated through the Department of Social Services Court. I'm being a former DSS attorney and also having presided over DSS cases for over 10 years. You can't make those kind of serious decisions coming in cold or having to have that learning curve under your belt. Um, The other thing is um, you should look at the record, look at what the candidate has done in the judicial arena as well as the legal arena. Um, NCCourts.org, You can look at the opinions that I've written and all the other judges on the Supreme Court, as well as the Court of Appeals. They're right there. All you have to do is type in the judge's last name if they appear on your ballot to see exactly what they've done in the past. And we want to remind folks to go to ncvoter.org so they can pull their specific ballot. And that way you can see which district court judges and other judges are you're able to vote for. Let's turn to Ms. Coleman. You've been both a county commissioner and a state representative. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in each position's level of decision making and uh, especially around our tax dollars? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, The county commission, of course, is a local government position. And this is really where the rubber meets the, the road because the decisions that county commissioners make Uh, you can see the impact on your daily life. Uh, You can't always see that in federal government or state government. Mm -hmm. And as far as the tax dollars, very important because county services fund are funded through your property taxes. One of the most important things that county government funds through your property taxes, of course, and Dr. Uh, Martin will agree with me, is school construction. Mm-hmm. School construction is very important simply because of uh, the growth in, in Wake County. Uh, I am uh, I was county commissioner here in Wake County, so that is where my experience is with county government. But I will tell you that the, um, the kinds of services that are funded by county government, we fund the sheriff's office, the uh, county board of elections, the register of deeds, human services, which includes um, social services, public health, mental health, developmental disabilities, uh, parks and recreation, waste, Mm -hmm. libraries, uh, open space, um, just so many services that impact your daily lives. And that's why it's so important that you really know exactly what's happening uh, in local government because it does impact you directly. And the on the statewide level, uh, as a state representative, those funds come primarily from the um, income taxes that you pay. Uh, the, de- the Department of Revenue collects revenue or your state income taxes annually. Uh, they do get some funds. Um, the uh, General Assembly does get some funds from the federal government, but primarily uh, the funds will come from state in- income taxes. And I can tell you that this past year, the North Carolina Department of Revenue collected over 42 
billion, billion with a B, dollars from state income taxes. And these taxes fund uh, services that the state provides. They also fund education. Uh, but I will tell you, while the um, school construction is um, funded from, um, from county dollars, it can never fill the gap that the General Assembly needs to fill through their appropriations of, um, of, of dollars for education. Mm -hmm. uh, but they fund education as well, the state, uh, state house. And uh, with education, they fund both the private and the public institutions in North Carolina. Uh, they also fund the salaries for community college employees, uh, teacher salaries, uh, state employee salaries. Uh, there's a housing trust fund, which uh, goes for uh, affordable housing. Uh, there's um, um, the, all of the state agencies receive an appropriations. And you saw those state agencies that you will be voting on in the upcoming um, election, which included offices like your uh, governor's office, your lieutenant governor's, your state auditor, agriculture, environment, uh, health and human services, uh, corrections for the prisons, uh, law enforcement. Uh, all of those funds are appropriated from the uh, General Assembly to fund the services uh, that the state provides to the citizens of North Carolina. That's great. That's great. Let's bring Dr. Martin in. Uh, uh, Ms. Coleman mentioned the school board and the appropriations from the county commission for the school board. I'm interested in both what um, education policies the, the school board puts together, as well as how you work with the county commissioners. Thank you, and it's a, a very, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, how you put together policy and what policies you put together is in part responsive to whatever's going on in your local district. Um, you know, I, I think one of the one of the things that that is really important to think about with respect to policy is um, you need to be persistent. You need to work with staff. Oftentimes, people will come in with an idea that I want this or that policy to change. Um, and when it's a policy we want changed, we want to be able to change it quite easily. But if it's a policy we're not sure it should be changed, we don't want it to change so easily. And so this is uh, something that I think we, you know, we may talk about a little bit more later. But one of the important things to understand about governance is you want democracy to be a little bit stubborn and cumbersome so that you don't just get things flipping back and forth. This was a real problem we had in Wake County back before I got on the board. In fact, it was one of the reasons I got on the Board of Education is a group of people came in and they tried to just change policy overnight based on their political agenda. They didn't work with the community. They didn't work with staff. And so we ended up getting a lot of chaos. The flip side, uh, you know, I, I would share work that I did, particularly on our discipline policies here in Wake County, it took more than five years to get some just basic changes to that policy. We'd make a little tweak and it was better, but we still left so many things untouched and you couldn't be satisfied with that tweak. You had to keep going, persistence, persistence, persistence. And with that persistence and working with staff, right? As, a, as the political elected official, you have to recognize that you're not just the one to make the decisions, but you've got to work with this team. You've got to work with the community to understand what's important to them. You've got to understand uh, your, your staff in the school who may have to apply the policy. You have to understand the perspective of the administrators who have to also apply the policy. Bring all those pieces together. Just keep working at it bit by bit by bit, but make sure you've got a strong, solid foundation for the why and then that policy can move forward. I guess the other thing I'd like to say um, uh, about policy is when you're making policy, think long-term. There were a lot of curricular issues, for example, that I would have loved to be able to weigh in on in terms of policy because I'm an educator. I do curriculum development. But I recognize that if I, develop, if I put myself in the role of curriculum 
development, then there's no reason any other school board member can't also put themselves in that role. And so I had to recognize, I need, even though it's my area of expertise, I needed to put checks and balances on myself because we need to make sure we have a policy structure that works no matter who's on the school board, whether you have experience in an area or not. Now, you also highlighted work with the commissioners. You know, I'm going to say partnership, partnership, partnership. Hmm. You got to have good lines of communication, but you also have to do a really good job of articulating your why. Too often times, school boards will be seen, perceived by commissioners as just, you're just asking for money, 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 money. <laughs> um, and if we don't give the why, then it does feel like it's just giving money, money, money. School systems are big. It's expensive. So for example, uh, let, let, let's take the reading initiatives that have gone on across the state. Everybody wants us to be make sure everybody can read at the third grade. And so it wasn't the local, but it was at the state level. We passed the read to achieve legislation. We want everybody to read by third grade. And associated with that was $30 million. Now in your or my pocket, $30 million seems like a lot of money, but we didn't communicate the why effectively because you see, just here in Wake County alone, and Wake County is only about 10% of the state, in Wake County alone, if I were to put one teacher in every elementary school, that would cost $5 million at a $50,000 salary, which would be a low salary and benefits, but just for easy figuring. So if it's $5 million for Wake County, that's $50 million for the state to just put one additional teacher per school, and yet the whole state budget was $30 million. So you see, people hear numbers, and if we don't have a why, if we don't have an understanding behind them, then it just seems like we're asking for large dollar values. And so when we're doing this work across units, I think the most important thing we can do is make sure we have a good why associated with our ask. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, I know we're here to talk about, you know, an upcoming election and getting people to vote, but I'm really interested in how, and this question is for any of you, how the public can be involved or should be engaged in your various um, elected positions. So for the school board, for the county commission, for any of the justice levels, anybody want to take a crack at that? It's important to emphasize that you start at the top and go all the way to the end. We heard the figures in the initial um, presentation tonight that a lot of people just do the drop off. They've come to vote for the president or the top of the ticket, but the tabletop candidates, the ones who really deal with your kitchen table discussions, everything that you're dealing with in your home, please don't forget them and encourage others to also vote. And I, I am also engaging people with the simple things that they can do Look at your cell phone and start with the alphabet A and go all the way through Z. Take 30 minutes per day and just go through them. Hey, are you registered? Have you have you early voted? This is going on now. And you take 10 a day. Um, we call it the top 10 list and just go through your cell phone. And then the other simple thing to think about is if you're in your car and you're going to vote and there's an empty seat next to you and your back seat is empty, then you're not really voting. Go pick up someone. Think about who, who needs a ride. If you go on your lunch break, take your colleagues. So we're really trying to find things simple to do that you can do in less than 10 minutes. Judge Thompson, you make a, a great relational organizer. That's exactly what we have our organizers do is to you know reach out family, friends, and extend. It. What about you, Ms. Coleman? What ways can people be engaged outside of voting? With the well, county certainly commission. they can um, attend some of the meetings. County commissioners meet uh, at least twice a month, uh, sometimes more frequently, depending on the work sessions. And those those uh, meetings, you learn what the what the issues are. And there's not an issue that county commissioners vote on that does not affect your everyday life. You need to know how it's affecting your life and your pocketbook. 
because you pay property taxes and how those tax dollars get spent really depends on your input. They have public comment sections um, each time they meet and people come and voice their concerns and their minds do get changed sometimes based on the input from citizens. But if citizens don't participate, if the elected officials, county commissioners, judges, whomever, school board members, if they don't hear from you, then whatever they do, you're just going to have to sit back and, and take it because you have not had your voice heard and you have your voice heard through your vote. You, that's why you need to know who you're voting for so that you make sure that who represents you represents your interest as well. And you can let them know when they're running what your interests are. And you also need to figure out what their top issues are so that you can figure out, well, is this someone who will represent my interest? Excellent. Dr. Martin, I'm going to give you the last word. How can we engage folks, the public? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just reinforce some of the things that were, were said, particularly from the school board. We, you know, we're always at the bottom of the ballot. And if it weren't for ballot fall off, that's a good place because your school, it, your schools are the foundation of your community. Mm. And so if you, you got to have a strong foundation, if you're going to have anything else. Um, but, you know, we often say start at the bottom of your ballot and work the other direction. That way you won't get tired because you're going to fill up the top of the ballot. Start at the bottom and work up is always a good thing. Um, you know, get to know your candidates. Um, it's easy to go to events and, and, and uh, you know, particularly candidates at various levels of the ballot. If you show up to an event, you're going to have conversation with that individual. And having conversation, you've got an ear now of with the decision maker. Are you going to be able to get your thing, whatever your interest is, passed? A whole lot more than if you didn't have conversation, but you're also going to get that give and take to recognize the complexity of governance. So, so go to events, get to know people. And of course, you know, like you've heard, tell your friends and neighbors. Um, in terms of finding out good candidates, Talk to your teachers to see if they know of people who are supportive of education. Um, so talk to people in your communities. They're going to have a good idea of who uh, effectively represents them. And when you know the who, you're much more likely to get good quality and much more likely to vote. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Um, this is great discussion. And now that we've had a chance to listen to some of our panelists, we want to open it up for questions. Um, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, and we're going to start first with the policy team to answer some questions that may have come up uh, earlier from the earlier uh, presentations, and then we'll take it directly to the panelists. Carol? Thank you so much, Adrian. So I did see a question about what the cure process was, and, and you might have remembered we um, did talk about that a little bit earlier tonight. And so cure refers to the process of making a correction to your ballot. And so absentee voters, um, as in like voters that are voting by mail, voters that are having issues with their photo ID, um, and same day voter registration voters all have options to making corrections to those ballots. And there is a deadline, which is the day before the county canvas um, that you have to return as in, to the county board of elections and provide the proper documentation. Or in some cases, you can provide that proof um, via fax or, or email. It just depends on your specific situation. So that's what we were referring to when we were using the word cure, and that's a really great question. Um, another question I saw was, does the nonpartisan ballot have candidates from all parties listed? Um, that is a question I actually will need to research a little bit, and we're, we're always happy to look at those and, and follow up with more information. Um, but we do want to highlight that everyone does have access to their own sample ballot um, through the State Board of Elections voter lookup tool. And we'll be dropping that link and sending it on um, after this pre presentation. But you are able to enter your information and then see uh, an example of your sample ballot that way. 
And if you ever have any trouble, that's what our hotline is for. We're always happy to look that information up for you. And then we had a question, which is actually maybe more for organizing. And because um, I might actually hold off on answering this directly, but um, it was a great question around um, what are some ways to really mobilize underrepresented voters, um, postcard writing or, or using other, other tools for that? Um, and Marquez is actually going to tell us in the end in a little bit around what some of those um, options are. So it's like a, a perfect segue in a little bit. But those were some of the policy questions we have. And now, JP, um, do you want to ask questions that we have for our panelists before we get into those advocacy tools? Sure. Yeah. Um, so great, great questions in the chat. And we've got mm, just in the past two minutes, uh, six or seven. So we're probably going to have to answer those uh, offline. But um, we have a great question here. Uh, I don't want to mispronounce your first name, but Miss Rhines, your question, uh, and this is for the whole uh, panel, but <clears throat> uh, maybe for um, the judge more than anybody else. Is there a possibility that there will be a legal requirement that Court of Appeals justices recuse themselves from cases wherein lie actual or perceived conflicts of interest? Sounds like something that was in the news recently. There, it doesn't just apply to the justices or the um, judges on the Court of Appeals. It could, uh, it could be your local judges as well. It's giving the appearance of having made a decision in advance of or a bias that someone may say you, you may have. Um, I can tell you that um, since I've taken the bench, if I have any any inkling of, a no, in, of knowledge about a particular case, and most recently involving my county, um, I simply just stepped aside and recused in advance of it being assigned to me as an appellate judge because that particular case happened in my community and I didn't want to give any um, sense that I may have already come in with perceptions of what how the case should um, come out. So it can happen on any judicial level, not just justices. But when judges are sitting in that in that role, we are to come in with a clean slate uh, of the facts and um, the particular issue at hand so that you can always count on a transparent ruling based upon the law and the constitution as it applies to the facts. I'd like to weigh in on that as well. That not only uh, refers to the judicial system, but it is also with um, administrative um, positions as well. For instance, I serve on the uh, community college board and at every meeting, uh, one of the first things that uh, happens is uh, we read the conflict of interest statement, and uh, that's one of the reasons we see re we receive the board material uh, before the meeting. Because if we have a conflict of interest, then we have to so state that uh, before the meeting begins and state what that conflict is. And you are recused; you you do recuse yourself uh, from voting on that matter. Excellent responses. Thank you all. Um, the next question might be a little less straightforward, but I want to ask the, the panel to get your thoughts here. Um, so we do have a lot of questions that uh, relate to the policy content and ways to get involved, which we'll, we'll be going over at the end of the call. We'll be answering those in uh, the Q&A section of the, the Zoom, but I want to ask the panelists, which positions can most effectively change the gerrymandering in North Carolina? Or maybe well, generally, the North Carolina Go General ahead. Assembly, <laughs> the North Carolina General Assembly, and uh, that's why uh, that's why participating in the census is so important. Uh, that determines so many things. It determines the resources that that uh, you get in your community, but it also determines which party is in control uh, every ten years. Uh, and so the party that's in control in the General Assembly is the party who uh, who gets to draw the lines. And gerrymandering has been going on for decades. Uh, it's not something that just started, but it is. Uh, it has gotten to the point now 
where it has created such a partisan divide that it makes government almost non-functional. Uh, but that is uh, the, the party and the General Assembly gets to decide that. Not the, uh, the only way it is overturned is it goes to the state Supreme Court and it moves on up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, it, the state Supreme Court can overturn it, but then uh, it can also go up to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me add that, I mean, people often don't think about it because we think about the, the gerrymandering of our state legislative districts and our federal uh, districts, but the county commissioners draw their districts. The school boards generally draw their districts. Every once in a while, the General Assembly will step in and think they know best, uh, but but the the local bodies do uh, draw their districts as well. It's supposed to be every ten years, um, and there is plenty of gerrymandering that happens there as well. So again, um, you know, I'm I will advocate as as hard as I can that we really need independent um, district drawing commissions, because even down at the school board member. Uh, when I ran the very first year, I was gerrymandered out of one district into another district. Now, it backfired on the folks who did the gerrymandering, but but the point is it really can happen at all levels, uh, which is why we all, I think, need to work for an independent commission. Well, I agree with that. And uh, maybe we can share some information about our fight for fair maps, uh, Democracy North Carolina, along with a lot of other Groups across the state are advocating for exactly what you laid out, Jim, an independent redistricting commission. So um, y'all stay tuned for that and stay engaged because I feel like that's an issue with gerrymandering. We kind of forget about it every 10 years, right? Um, Jim, I want to ask another question to you. Uh, you ran for local office in Wake County, and I wanted to ask um, <clears throat> how... Uh, roughly how many voters you needed to persuade in order to win that seat? Because I think a lot of people see, oh, I can't run for office. I would need to get a million votes. And this is not to, uh, to you know, whatever about how many votes you got, but would love to know, was that daunting for you? And uh, this could be for any of the candidates, really. Um, and were you surprised at how much it took or how much it didn't take to, to win that seat? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, and and it, it it is... Right. Wake, Wake County is different than the school board races across the state, but then again, not unlike some of the legislative races across the state. My school board district was as large as, in fact, larger than some of the North Carolina General Assembly districts. Uh, yeah, I had, uh, boy, I haven't looked at the numbers right uh, recently, but uh, 150 to 180,000 uh, voters or something like that in the district. Right. So so you, not everybody's going to vote, but I needed between uh, 45 and 50,000 uh, to win. Uh, so you've got to make a, a lot of contacts. There's a lot of people that don't like the money that gets involved in a political campaign. I being one of them, I don't like the money that gets involved. But if you're going to touch voters, it costs money. Right. Till you send a postcard, till you print it and send it. You're talking 50, 60 cents a card. Multiply that by a thousand households and you're talking some real dollars. So uh, it is daunting uh, at all levels, even at the local level. And critically, if we don't engage, if we just sort of let it happen, then we get things happening to us like happened in the Wake County Board of Education back in 2009, which was the, the race the year before I, I ran. People just didn't pay much attention to it. If you don't pay attention to a local race, you're going to get what you don't pay attention to. So I, I would argue that, you know, from the most basic races, you got to run as seriously as you can. It's expensive. So if you're not running yourself, help whoever is running. It really does make a difference. That $25, that $50, $250 makes a big difference in contacting voters. And there's a lot of people you got to contact. I would say also that one of the things that um, happened is that I found quite surprising was the number of uh, precincts that you had to win. You have to win all of them in Wake County for a county commission race. Uh, 
the first time when I ran, there were 139 uh, precincts in Wake County. Now there are over 200 precincts in Wake County, and you have to run in all of those precincts. However, but when I ran for the General Assembly, I only had 25 precincts. But the difference was it costs less than $30,000 to win a county commission seat when it cost well over $100,000 for a legislative seat. And so, wait, but that's Wake County because it costs more to run in Wake County than it does in probably 99 other counties. Um, someone from Robinson County, they can win a race with fifteen or twenty thousand dollars versus you're going to need one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand in Wake County. Statewide campaign, all one hundred counties, and when you said daunting, it's 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 crazy. Um, I literally have to make sure. Every county um, understands the importance of the judicial system. So what we're doing is starting with the smaller counties, the rural counties, where statewide candidates tend to forget or not be able to get to. Statewide candidates want to go to the big mix and the Wakes and the Durham counties, but we're focusing on the rural community. And I can tell you, we've heard several times, thank you for coming by to check on us because no one really comes out to see about us and our vote, like, you know, the small counties like um, Lee County, Duplin, Martin, um, when we hit the ground and canvas, they are so grateful that a statewide candidate took the time to come by and introduce themselves or, or find out what the issues are on their level. Because again, most of the money goes to the larger counties such as Wake and Mack and Durham. And those voters are just as important, if not more, because they can actually help a candidate on a statewide level pass the word in their community to stack the numbers in favor of the statewide candidate. And if I could just add uh, to that, you know, it's when when we run races, it's easy to run for our to our base. Our base is going to vote for us probably anyway. Yes, we need turnout. So when you're working for your base, turnout is the game. But what we often forget, what many candidates often forget, is if you can talk to persuadables of the other party, of the other persuasion, right? I'm a Democrat. I believe that school boards should be nonpartisan. Uh, I'll passionately argue for that. But I'll tell you that for every Republican vote I got, that's effectively two votes because I don't get the vote for the other guy and I get it for me. So when we're talking about campaigning, particularly an organization like this, a nonpartisan uh, organization, make sure you run and work with persuadable voters, not just your base, because that's where you yeah, turn out your base. But that's what party structures are for. Organizations like yourselves, the goal, I think, can really leverage things if you work more at the persuadable, because like I say, for me, it was every Republican I, I got was two votes. Every Democrat I got was one vote. So play your numbers because you All got right. it. You got to get a winning margin. Well, Carolyn, Linda, Jim, thank you so much for these responses. And uh, that makes for a great segue into our next section. We're going to talk about how to get involved. Um, and I couldn't think of anybody better to talk kick us off than Marquez. So over to you, Marquez. Thank you so much. Let's give our panelists a hand. You might have to do it with the visually or user reactions, but what a great discussion, great questions, great job, um, all of you. I've, I've learned so much. I want to uh, highlight what uh, what uh, Adrian said uh, about Judge Thompson, about how, you know, organizers use those same tactics. I've just found that people with the last name Thompson are good at organizing. I, I just, something that I just kind of found out. It's, um, listen, y'all, it's 702 now, so we appreciate we um, are in the home stretch. We know that um, we want to get you out of here really soon. So if you can just hang out with us for just a few more minutes, we do want to answer the questions that you have about uh, how you can get involved, as JP was saying. And I will want to answer the, the question that was put in the chat. We do have regional people uh, that are doing some uh, postcards in very targeted areas. So um, you'll get information about how to contact your regional organizer to, to see how to get involved with that. But, uh, but as I was saying, it's important to get involved 
So we do have some resources that we're going to talk to you about. Um, if you want to get your sample ballot, you can go to dmnc.co uh, slash lookup to find your sample ballot. You can also go to vote or, uh, vote411.org to see who's on the ballot. Also, there are nonpartisan voter guides that you can print and that might be also online that different organizations are doing. And, uh, and also, uh, as was mentioned in the discussion, if you want to talk about local endorsements, go to trusted sources. Go to um, the, the organizations that you trust that are, are doing this thing. Go to um, newspapers or editorials or media to learn more about candidates and go to trusted sources to, to find out, uh, um, to get ideas about who to vote for. As I mentioned before, um, when you talk about um, the work that we're doing and how you can be a part of the work that we're doing, uh, if you like this meeting, we have do meetings not not this big, not with these great guests, but just as important in your local communities on a monthly basis. Every month, uh, regional managing organizers host monthly coalition meetings or uh, coalition calls to create space where advocates like you can receive information like this, updates on election uh, related legislation, litigation, election administration changes, as well as we ask people to be thought partners on how to support voters and, and how to make our communities thrive. So our ROs, they want to hear from you and they want to help you to get involved in the work. We, we care about what matters to you and to your family, your church group, all of these different community leaders. We want to be a part of, of the work that they're doing so that and to help you be connected to these resources so that you can be a leader in your community. Uh, I'm going to pass it also to uh, Saisa, who's going to talk to us about another way you can get involved uh, with phone banking. Um, howdy, y'all. My name is Saisa Schumann, and I'm the Volunteer Program Associate with Democracy NC. Um, I want to talk to you about an initiative me and Democracy NC have been putting together, which is a phone banking team. Phone banking is a wonderful way to get in touch with our communities and make sure that they have access to all of the information they need in order to cast their votes. Um, and also to help um, overcome some of the barriers that are being put into place because of legislation like voter ID. Um, if you are interested in volunteering with Democracy NC or in, are interested in phone banking, you can join us um, February 26th. That's a Monday where we will be reaching out to our advocates um, and making sure that they have a plan to vote. And then again, on Thursday, February 29th, um, y'all have heard a little bit of, about the legislation surrounding voter ID. And I know a lot of it sounds confusing. Um, and that means that folks who go to the polls might be confused as well. So that phone banking on Thursday, February 29th is to contact anyone who has put in their provisional ballot and might need to do extra steps to make sure their vote is casted. Um, volunteers who engage with democracy and see in these ways are making sure that even when these barriers and these boundaries are put up, we are directly communicating with folks and making sure that no matter what is happening, they have equitable access to ballots, to their um, voting locations and everything that they need. Um, if you are in the Morrisville area, I am very interested in talking to you because we have a lot of things that we do in our headquarters office that support our efforts all across the state of North Carolina. Um, but whether you're interested in phone banking or getting involved in any other way, or if you just like want action alerts about what's happening in the state around you, I recommend that you vote. Um, you visit our Mobilize page. That's mobilize.us slash democracy NC. That's one of those links you don't have to memorize. We'll let you know about it. Um, and that will be our hub for ways to get involved, not only with democracy NC, but with your community. And I'm going to pass it off to whoever is next. I, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that would be me. Thank you, Saisa. Um, and yeah, many of you are probably familiar with our poll monitoring program. Uh, called the Vote Protector Program. It might be the first way you got involved with them and see. Uh, we are doing a poll monitor program for the primary. It is already underway. We have completed our first round of trainings. If you've missed uh, the trainings that we had two weeks ago, that's okay. We're going to put an interest form in the chat for a last-minute training that I'm going to try to do uh, next week. 
uh, that would be open only to returning vote protectors because we have to get you materials, these beautiful yellow shirts that you see our models wearing here. Um, but there is still so much to do for this election after election day, uh, particularly around um, elections advocacy, uh, the phone banking that Saisa was talking about. And so to hear more about what we should be doing after election day, um, I'm going to pass it over to Keith. And in the meantime, we'll put in the chat here ways you can still get involved with our poll monitoring program. Thank you. All right. Thank you, JP. So one of the things I would love for all of you to do is to become an elections advocate. So elections advocates build relationships with county board of elections and advocate for things like uh, early voting access and better funding towards elections. So in the 2023 municipal elections, uh, we had elections advocates monitor the canvas or the process uh, to count votes. And so those canvas monitors or elections advocates helped us collect information of how the review process of ID exception forms was being conducted and how it was being conducted differently across the state. So not only were legal canvas monitors able to make corrections to the process in real time, but in partnership with elections advocates across several organizations, we were able to collect enough reports to support recommendations for improvement to the North Carolina State Board of Elections. And if you're interested in uh, becoming an elections advocate and engaging in our canvas monitoring program, there will be a live canvas training uh, next Wednesday on February 28th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And if you can't make that, we also have an on-demand option, which you can do um, on your own time. And I'll also be in contact with those of you who do it that way, just to make sure everything is going smoothly. Uh, the last thing that I'll say uh, with the elections advocates, we do have a monthly meeting. Um, I'm trying to make it a little bit more consistent, but we do have a monthly meeting where you can hang out with me and one of our monitors, John, who's on the call too, uh, to talk about elections advocacy and what to keep an eye out for in future County Board of Elections meetings. And I'll pass it over uh, to you, Rep. Steph, from one Dem Summer to another, Dem Summer alum to another Dem Summer alum for your part. Exactly, thank you, thank you, Keith. Uh, as you said, my name is Reverend Stefan Weathers Sr. I'm the program manager uh, for young adult engagement. Uh, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Listen, this is one way that you can be involved is be a bridge uh, between young people being involved, especially college students. I mean, so the Democracy Summer Internship Program, uh, we will be in its 25th year uh, this summer. Uh, if you've been doing something for 25 years well, uh, then, you know, that's something to, you know, that's nothing to sneeze about. That's something we should applaud. And so anyway, Democracy Summer, and if you are a young person on the call right now, a college student on the call, uh, this may be an opportunity for you. This is an opportunity to uh, train up the next generation of democracy advocates in the state of North Carolina. Uh, the application period is already open right now, um, and it ends March 15th. So if you know a young person, a uh, college student, if you, know a, if, you, if you are a college student on this call currently, March 15th is the deadline to participate or to get your application in to participate in Democracy Summer. Now, there are a couple of things that I do have to note. So two major requirements is that you must be enrolled um, in a North Carolina community college or four-year institution. Uh, it must be a rising sophomore, junior, or senior. So, you know, if you're a grad student, uh, you know, sorry, um, but, you know, it's, it's for those who are in undergraduate um, and again, in our North Carolina uh, community colleges and four-year um, institutions. Also, students cannot participate if they're going to be enrolled in summer classes um, or if they have some type of other work and part-time job. Um, that's just because this this work is, will uh, will be uh, will take the energy and will take the effort uh, uh, to truly be successful in. And so, again, our departments are organizing policy, communications, development, and operations. Uh, and so our students can become interns in any of those departments. Um, and so, yeah, I would drop the, if somebody hasn't already done it, I would drop the link in the chat uh, that gives you the full breakdown of the program, but also provides you with the actual uh, link to for, uh, for a college student to apply. And with that being said, I'll kick it off to, I'm not sure, is Caleb on the call or I'll pass it off to whoever uh, will be speaking instead. If 
Caleb is he's on the call. I think Caleb's just on me. Go ahead, Caleb. Take hey, y'all. Um, glad to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Caleb Ponson, and I am the development manager at Democracy NC. Uh, as we have seen throughout tonight's presentation, our mission to safeguard voting rights is more critical than ever. From volunteering to phone bank and distribute yard signs to sharing election resources and attending county board of elections meetings, there are so many opportunities to get involved during this year's election. And there are three easy ways to support our work with a charitable donation. First, uh, please consider becoming a monthly sustainer Monthly donations support our work all year round, funding programs like Democracy Summer, Vote Protectors, and local elections advocacy. Another great option is to join the Democracy NC Giving Society. This is a new program that we launched in the fall to build long-term meaningful relationships with our supporters across all 100 counties. The Democracy NC Giving Society also funds work like election protection, and purchasing radio and print advertising. Lastly, uh, you can choose to make a gift in honor of your regional organizer. Gifts made in honor or in memory of someone are a great way to tell them that you appreciate them and would like to honor their efforts uh, for a special occasion, uh, birthday, or after a regional uh, coalition meeting. To make a gift to Democracy North Carolina, you can visit Democracy NC dot org slash donate. Uh, this year, y'all, we got to protect the rights of our families, our friends, our neighbors, and for the communities that we live in. So please stand with us and make a gift to support our work today. Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. Well, you have heard a wealth of information from our team, and we've had a rich discussion uh, from our panelists. I'm sure we could have continued having that conversation for quite a while. So we really appreciate y'all joining us this evening. As we close, I want you to remember the most important thing is that you share what you've learned this evening. If you or someone you know has voting related questions or any kind of problems related to voting, um, we can answer them for you. So a reminder to call the hotline at 888-OUR-VOTE. That's 888-687-8683. There's also plenty of information at our voter information website, ncvoter.org, which is your trusted source for election information. After this training, you'll receive a number of things, a copy of our slides and recording, our voter resources, such as what's on the ballot, voter ID, and the 2024 wallet card, a sign-up page for all of the opportunities that you've heard that you can get involved in, and our contact information if you have any remaining questions. We are so grateful that you joined us tonight. Have a wonderful evening and get out there and vote. Thank you. <laughs>